uh, where we'll now be uh, featuring members of Together All's Guardian Council to understand how the business has embedded a system to evaluate their assertions about the impact that they're making. Um, the moderator for this session is Kevin Bone, uh, one of the leading impact investors in the UK, partner at Lightrock and an early investor in Together All. Uh, and he'll be joined by Ian McPherson, the chair of Surrey and Borders Partnership and NHS Foundation Trust, uh, Laura Horn, Chief Programme Officer of Active Minds. Uh, Liam Black will be joining us again for this, se this second session. Uh, Poppy Jaman, uh, the CEO of the City Mental Health Alliance. And Satna Mahajan, who is the Director of Genomics and Society at Genome Canada. Uh, so over to you, Kevin, to kick it off. Thanks, Tom. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Tom said, my name is Kevin Bone. I'm a partner at Lightrock a global impact investor. At Lightrock, we only invest in businesses which are actively seeking to address major societal or environmental issues. But it's important to note that we seek normal venture capital returns. We're not soft money in that sense. We invested in Together All six years ago when it was an early stage business with a few fledgling contracts with the NHS and other statutory bodies here in the UK. Since then, thanks to the great work of the team, but also due to the unfortunate explosion in mental health issues, the business has grown exponentially, now providing a critical at point of need service to millions of people globally. I'm an active board member with the company for six years now, and incredibly proud of the amazing work it does. As Tom said, this session is a case study on how a purpose-led business can be held to account, as entitled, What is a Guardian Council and how can it help? Give that insight, I'm delighted to be joined by Poppy, Laura, Satna and Ian, esteemed members of the Guardian Council, and my good friend Liam Black, who was instrumental not only in Together All's growth, but critically, the formation of the Guardian Council, which he now chairs. I'm also being joined very quietly in the background by my daughter coming back from school, so we'll move on from that. Um, welcome to you all. Um, the for, for everyone who's joined us here today, the format of the session is I will pose a few questions to the panel that will hopefully provide some food for thought. Then we'll open up to Q&A from the audience. And I believe you can pose questions and comments in the chat function, which I will endeavor to incorporate there as best I can. So with that introduction, I'll start with you, Liam, and a question for you. What does Together All want to achieve with the council? And why do you feel that this is the best way of achieving those aims? Thanks, Kevin. H hello, guys. Um, what we want to achieve with the council goes back to how do we um, ensure that the trust between us and our members, the members being the thousands of people who use um, our platform um, uh, uh, when they're feeling anxious um, or depressed, how do we ensure that the trust that, that is at the heart of that um, can endure? How can people trust us? How can the members trust us? How can people who invest in the business trust that what we are about is about really tackling this epidemic um, uh, 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 in mental health? And so we thought, well, one of the ways, so there's a number of ways that we do that. Internally, we have what we think are world-class and very robust risk management processes. We have a, a great executive team, both on the commercial and the clinical side. Uh, but that's all internal. And when we were thinking about how can we demonstrate our commitment to transparency and be held to account, the idea, uh, we were inspired by a company called Yoti, which is an online um, identity business, who had created a Guardian Council, a, a group of well-respected people from uh, their world um, who uh, were brought together in order to interrogate the business and to hold it to account. And we thought, well, maybe we could be uh, the first mental health business, a digital mental health business, to have a guardian council. So the, the idea behind it is part of our attempt as a business to hold ourselves accountable, as well as to uh, tap into the amazing experience and knowledge and networks um, of the guardian council. So uh, we're, trying to, we're going for B Corp status. We think we have very robust internal processes. The guardian council is sort of the the kind of cherry on the cake, as it were, um, uh, of ways and processes and structures that we hold ourselves to account. Uh, to, we make ourselves accountable in order to, to protect our most precious asset, 
which is the trust that the world has in us as a business. Follow up on that and, and to actually to any panel member, Liam talked there a lot about trust and needs to maintain trust. Why do you think it's important for business, which is a commercial business, to exhibit that trust so strongly? Oh, that's Poppy. Thanks. Um, thanks, Kevin. And hi, hi, everyone. Really good to be on this on this event and having uh, such an important conversation. So look, for me, I, I joined because when Liam talked me through the concept of the Guardian Council, I just thought it was absolutely brilliant in terms of not having direct responsibilities around, you know, the executives of an organization, because I do that already, but actually to have stewardship of the agenda. And I've worked in the mental health world for 20 plus years now. And for me, the mental health agenda and making sure that we are creating a, a narrative, a story, services uh, around the world where, 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 where businesses aren't prioritizing money and profit but actually prioritizing the agenda and how we progress it for the rest of the world. So for me, stewardship of this agenda was, was why I think, I, well, well I, I know I joined and I think that's the role of the Guardian Council because we're all very different with our different perspectives, but we hold ourselves and the organization to account for, are we actually doing the right thing by this on, in the world? Anyone else like to jump in here? Just, maybe just to add to that, I, I think it, it is for all the right and altruistic reasons, but it's also because trust is going to be centered to delivering products that people want. People are fed up with their experience and of not getting quality, getting people who are interested in money. There's a lot of digital organizations out there and there's a lot of online services being provided and it seems to me that something that differentiates together all from others who are maybe not quite as concerned about the, the needs of both the individuals they serve but the communities they support is extremely important so from a business perspective it's not just altruistic it's pragmatic as well and i think it's because together all has already taken this stance it was makes it a more attractive option and something i feel comfortable being associated with whereas that wouldn't be the case for every uh, organization who's operating in this field I can add to that. I mean, I think what got me really interested because Ian said something really important, which is it is a very busy market and there's lots of organizations trying to offer different forms of online support. And when I heard about this organization, I felt like they were actually walking the talk about, yes, having, of course, we align with the shareholders. I mean, we do want the organization to be successful and to grow to new markets and make a profit. But it was about really holding on to our values and the core reason why this organization started. And it's a real privilege to be an ambassador and someone who can be part of the process of really authentically and thoughtfully thinking around some of the decisions. And it kind of offers a balance to those other priorities. And so I think profitability and growth is still a priority, but these other pieces have remained at a balance. And from what our, we've experienced so far, because we've had some meetings, is that it really is genuine and thoughtful, and it's not a group that's engaged after a decision, but at the front end. So I think it's about walking the talk. And in the end, I really believe this kind of council will increase loyalty, your advocacy, people wanting to tell other people to, to use the product, because they see that you're walking the talk and, and, and the reputation of the folks around here and the, the expertise. I can round us out and just add, you know, I am really excited about what Together All is doing because I think mental health is the number one issue that we need to tackle globally. And 
um, still has a very, very long way to go. And I, th I think we need a lot of innovation in this space. And I do think people are fed up and especially young adults who, you know, I work with a lot at Active Minds, the next generation coming up are the ones who are really trying to hold these businesses to account more than anyone. And they really want um, authenticity from the organizations that they're engaging with. And we need to see more progress on mental health and this idea of peer support and empowering our communities to be a part of improving mental health together is what Together All is offering. And I, I think that's so early and, and so different and new and we need more of that. And so I'm excited to be a part of an organization that's really tackling that. It's really hard work. And that's why Together All has done the work of putting these robust systems in place. And many other organizations haven't been able to because it, it is really challenging to do. And I think in order to balance revenue and social impact, you have to have these tough conversations and you need um, an entity to hold space for that. And, and what I love about this model is that it's not treating um, social impact as a philanthropic um, arm of an organization separate from revenue generation, but it, it's part of the core business. And so we are tackling those conversations and, and it's a striving. You know, we may not always get it right, but we are doing it with intentionality and as part of the core business of what Together All is trying to accomplish. Thank you. Um, so those are the reasons why you were keen and they really resonate. But the flip side of the coin is what were you concerned about joining this? Uh, and all the concerns then, what are the concerns now? Is that you've got great reputations, well-known, authentic people yourself. So what were your concerns? I can, I, I can, so for me, the concerns were, you know, what, who were the, where, where was the money coming from and what strings are attached to those, to that, to that money? And is that money, you know, I, I'm not against profit, you know, so I, I really believe in the social enterprise model. And I, again, the other attractive part was this, this journey towards becoming a B. And for me, I, I love the idea that if every business in the world was a B Corp, I think a lot of the problems that we've got in the world and the next generation are facing wouldn't be here. So I wanted to be part of the forefront of taking, helping take an organization to B Corp status, learning myself, and then being able to demonstrate to big brands how you become an authentic business like to Laura's point that is taking care of the planet that is taking care of its people that is taking care of the way that is it's receiving money and and spending money and the profit that it's making you know I always think you know how much money do you need to survive <laughs> and you know how wealthy do we need to be and what at what expense does that does that come at and I feel like together all are going on that journey so for me the main concern was where is the money go coming from and and what strings were attached to that and we're working through that as an organ you know as a as a guardian council we're learning as we're going along and ian's often asking some of the really crucial questions around finances because of his you know his experience in this space so that that was my concern kevin and i and I, I'm still learning and I'm feeling reassured and asking the right questions. And what I love is the executives then respond to that in a very thoughtful, open, curious way. There isn't resistance. They're all going, oh, we hadn't thought about that. And I think that's that relationship works really well where we're, we're being curious and we're being received with, with our intention there as opposed to, oh no, here's a board member or another guardian or, you know, as a person that's, just being annoying because they're asking too many questions. And I, I, I love that about the way Together All is set up. They save that, they save that emotion when I deal with them, Poppy. They, they love you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, a keep, I'm keeping you till last, Kevin, as a big disappointment for everyone. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else want to follow that in terms of the concerns? Just a, a concern I have, I work in the NHS, uh, National Health Service in uh, England and National Health Service works with private for-profit organizations as well as voluntary organizations, but it has to be said there is a fair degree of skepticism about people's motivations. Uh, even when they're doing a very good job, there is always a degree of resentment 
And I suppose one of the things that I was concerned about was would by associating myself with this uh, together or would I be seen to be associating with the, if you like, the dark side? Uh, well, I'm very comfortable, to be fair, because I've seen more of the dark side in the NHS and indeed in the not-for-profit sector than I've seen uh, with working with colleagues and together all. Um, I have a very simple thing. If, you know, this is an excellent product, would I use it? Yes. Would I ask my friends to use it? Yes. Would I recommend it? Yes, because it works for in a very different way. And I think being able to be comfortable about that and be comfortable the fact that, yes, it's got to be a successful business, because if it's not a successful business, it will not be sustained. So there's a, a, a if you like, a, a sense for me now that I'm very comfortable if anybody wanted to, they haven't, but if anybody wanted to challenge me about an association with this as a, a private or a for-profit organisation, because it is actually delivering goods in a way that, and is also genuinely concerned about the social impact of the business. So that's in a way, I think something that will be helpful uh, to overcome some of the, the tensions that have historically been there between the NHS and private sector colleagues. I think one of the concerns I had or questions was, will we be presented as a guardian council, but it will truly be behind the scenes, another advisory committee. Um, and I think one of the differentiating factors between the advisory committee and a guardian council is that we have insight into what's going on in the organization such that we can be proactive. We're not just being called on to respond to questions, but we know enough that we can actually shape where the company is going and ask the questions proactively that aren't being asked already. And, and if anything, I think so far, I've just been, it's been a lot of information about what's going on and we're meeting all the leaders, we're meeting with Henry, the CEO, we meet with the other um, department leads. And if anything, it's like, what are we doing? Like, are, is there enough, are we doing enough? Are we doing our job? Because I, I feel like we're learning a lot about and I feel like I could work it together all, you know, I feel like I could share with someone else about what's going on. Um, and if anything, it's, it's been the opposite of what I, I thought it might be, um, you know, hoped it wouldn't be. So it's been pleasant surprise to know that we are being given a lot of insight and developing relationships with people within Together All so that we can feel confident in the role that we're serving and also in how we're being presented as the council. I, I was quite skeptic and, and, and I'm from Canada on the other side of the water, you know, and uh, a company that was putting together a guardian council, I was skeptic about how authentic they wanted it or if it was more just um, a tokenism piece, to be honest, which I've you know been very happy to see it's completely opposite. I think we're, I feel very involved in informing the decision-making ahead of time, et cetera. So I think it's been really uh, rewarding. I also think that they did a really, I would say like the diversity piece and inclusion is something we've talked a lot about. And it's something I see reflected here, but also it's some other perspective we brought. And I worried a little bit about those pieces. And I, I think like many very pleasantly surprised. I, I also did worry about the perception from colleagues and organizations that I work with around sitting on a company's, you know, that's for profit. And it's been received really, really well. And I think it's because of something like the Guardian Council. And it speaks a lot to the great work you're doing, Liam, and together all. So um, I don't have significant concerns anymore. Kevin, can I just add one small point to that? Like, I've, I've often been approached, um, or I've seen advisory groups or advisory boards, just, just building on what Sapna was saying, where you're recruiting people that are a safe pair of hands. So you want somebody because of their background, their experience, whether it's the NHS, whether it's social sector, but you want you don't want them to be vocal. I think together all have taken quite an interesting um, risk with putting us together in the in, in the Guardian Council because we're pretty vocal. <laughs> we're, we, we've got we've got platforms externally, whether it's on social media or the influence in the communities that we're connected with. 
And if we saw something that we didn't like, like there is no constraints on what we can and can't say, or even if one of us when actually we're exiting the Guardian Council, like that would be a very strong message having announced that this is the Guardian Council. And I think I've been part of processes before where in the end I didn't get through because it was um, it wasn't quite the safe pair of hands. And, and I think that is really important part of this is not just picking if, if, if others listening are thinking about putting together a group like this, like you've got to really think about whether you want people that can add to your reputation or harm your reputation if they step out. And if you're willing to sit on the, 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 the pinnacle of that, then you've got the right people and you've got the right intentions behind um, quality assurance and integrity and authenticity. So thanks, everybody. That leads me into the question I was going to pose to Liam about how did you go about choosing the composition of, of, of the Guardian Council? And did you tell them that you referred to them before you, you engaged them as the awkward squad or not? <laughs> Evan, sorry. Um, sorry. So, so we, uh, uh, it was a very, it was a, I talked to some fantastic people um, during the process. Uh, so we, but basically uh, within the company and outside the company sort of put feelers out saying that you know, this is the kind of group that we want to put together. Um, an important point that uh, Henry, our CEO, and I agreed on and the rest of the board was that the Guardian Council, that members of the Guardian Council aren't there, they need to be supportive of the, the model that we have, the peer-to-peer -peer anonymous community uh, population approach to, to, to mental health care. I talked to some amazing people um, in the NHS, in academia, um, who were you know, was not skeptical, but they weren't as passionate about this model. So the Guardian Council is not selected in order to ask fundamental questions about the, the entire proposition. They're, they're people who buy the proposition, as in peer-to-peer -peer population health, but are there in order to um, help us to improve that and, and hold us to account. So that was the lens that we went out, um, and we knew that we had to have it geographically spread, we knew that we needed to have it uh, uh, diverse um, uh, uh, as we could make it, and we need and we knew that we need we wanted to have people who could speak with authority from the various um, sectors that we're in: Laura in education, Ian um, um, uh, NHS, uh, Poppy and Sapna and Steve, who's unable to be with us today, across a number of those, but also very focused um, on um, uh, uh, em the employers um, and the private sector. So we, 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 drew, we drew that up and we went out and we interviewed people and it was a fairly rigorous interview that, and then eventually a, lot, a short list came to the board um, and there was lots of questions about that. Poppy's you know, question about risk is, is having a, 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 a guardian council like this a diligence risk? If someone wanted to invest us in the future, are they going to go, oh my God, you've got Poppy Germain involved? Um, yeah, that, that's very risky. And for me, and I think for the rest of the board and Kevin, you're on, you're on that board and a very, eventual, a very influential member of it. The fact that it is a bit risky to have people who, are, who have very strong opinions, who have their own reputation out there in the world to come into our business, have access to all of the data, um, access to all of the exec is a bit risky. But if we don't take that risk, then we don't end up by with being authentically held to account. And we end up with a really boring advisory group. And every company has boring advisory groups. What we want is a very active, engaged, but sufficiently independent and arm's length uh, group of people to help us develop the business and to hold us to account. There have been two examples recently uh, where offers were made to, uh, to, to the company, which we were like, mm, we're not sure, let us bring it to the Guardian Council. And in both of those uh, uh, um, examples, obviously I can't give you the detail of it, but in both of those examples, the Guardian Council brought a lot of wisdom and a lot of an arm's length um, analysis, which helped us to make decisions. So ultimately the decisions remain, decisions taken by the board who own the company and are you know, legally responsible for it. But that role of the Guardian Council as advisor, provocateur, interrogator um, and supporter 
uh, so far um, has been very positive and um, yeah it, it, and we're still learning we've we've you know we've only been together for um, a few months and, and for me the biggest challenge of chairing it is the you know we talked about this at our last meeting that working on the reactive side bringing things to the council for them to think about that we are planning to do or we uh, or we have done that's relatively straightforward and that's you know there's lo loads of stuff coming and you're going to get lots next week by the way guys um, but how can to what level can the guardian council be proactive and sort of really lean into the business and ask other questions uh, about us that's something that we're still uh, learning and i think if we can get the relationships right then i think we'll work itself out well for us Oh, you look like you're going to jump in there. No? No? Okay. Um, for, for panel members, what, what what do you think good looks like for the Guardian Council and its influence on Together? I mean, it's early days, um, but you, you've got a good feel for the business, it's been very open book, very engaged. What would you what would you feel look back in a period of time and say that that was that was great, that we, we achieved what we wanted to achieve? Um, I, one thing I think is this proactive strategic discussion, bringing in different perspectives that maybe you would not get or maybe enhanced, but different than maybe what you would just have among shareholders or board. And, you know, we've already had some discussions on strategic partnerships and just challenging and asking questions that maybe wouldn't be asked. And when I look back, if I was to look back in a year or two years of what success was, I think it's helping to inform some critical decision points and pivot points in the organization that led it to success or helped it to success, but at the same time, kept it aligned with its values, its principles. We were thoughtful. We, And sometimes it might mean making hard decisions and saying no to something and then looking back and saying, that was great that we stood by that and look at the benefits we've had. And now we can revisit it and expand. So I think I think it'll take a couple of years to see some of those outcomes and impacts from some of those discussions now, but I think all of us being honest, authentic, and being truly engaged through the process itself is a success factor. Yeah, I, just to, to echo in a way, Satna, uh, I think I was very pleasantly surprised how proactive uh, the board have been in coming forward with things that are in a very early stage and asking for advice because in my experience that doesn't happen within organizations normally uh, the executive have worked up something and it's presented as an, an option appraisal to the board where you know just tick here um, I'm not saying that happens in every organization but I've, on both sides as an executive and a non-executive I've, I've been aware that actually taking the risk of sharing with a group of people who don't know the business and can't never know the business in the way that the board does, actually saying, well, look at it not from a traditional business proposal, but look at it from, does this feel right? How does this align with our values? Are we likely to enhance our reputation by going in this direction? Would it potentially cause some concerns? And I think that's amazing because I I would like to see, I mean, I'm learning a great deal as being part of the, the Guardian Council. And I just feel this is missing in so many other organizations. And it would be very healthy if we had a group of the type we have here. Who I, I, I work in an organization that has a council of governors, but it's a very different thing. Um, some great advice sometimes and very helpful but it, it it's too large to have the to have the, the the level of input that we are able to offer and at the end of the day i think there's often confusion about what is the role um, and the role has to be that the executive and the board make the decisions uh, they listen to the advice and then have to move that forward so thus far i i, I feel that's something that is an excellent idea and something I would like to, if I have the opportunity, introduce into other organizations that I'm involved with. Can I just jump in there, Kevin? Um, Eric Levine at Yoti 
who uh, who was the inspiration for this. Eric chairs the Guardian Council uh, there. We, we were talking uh, recently and you know one of the things we'd love to see is the spread of Guardian Councils and I, I think one of the um, I think well again part of the bravery of the board of Together All in doing this is to model what this looks like. So you know if, if, if every if it's imagine if every business in our market in the digital health market had a group of you know a similar group that were helping make decisions and build trust that then builds a you know a broader movement that is in the interests of um, the users of our services as well as the kind of approach to digital mental health care yeah i wonder if eventually there's an opportunity to draw a line from organizations that have guardian councils and the experiences of their members like how do all the work that we do trickle down to the members and what are the metrics that we need to look at to be able to measure that and help make the case you know for the role that we know guardian councils are playing and a couple of thoughts from me on the, on that kevin oh, sorry liam did you did you want to did i no just very briefly just say you know the purpose of having this conversation which i hope will be the first of a number that we have with 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 uh, a sort of wider community is very much part of that laura of sharing what we are doing in an honest way with people outside of uh, outside of the family as it were i think it's really important yeah De definitely and I, I think so to chime in on on sort of influencing other organization there's another organization that um, i'm involved in and we were having a chat last friday about creating a guardian council of just young people so 13 to 21 year olds and we were like oh what, what like really do it and, <laughs> and <me. laughs> like really do it not like a advisory group that we go to actually have them as the guardian council because the agenda that that this organization is leading is it is planetary health and who is more concerned than the younger generation and actually it's been a huge it, it's had a huge negative impact on the next generation so what if we had a guardian council that were 13 to 18 and it's radical thinking and everybody loved it and so already I think one of the things that Together All is doing is creating leaders of the future through this model and I'm I'm you know really really up for helping think that through and and putting that out there as this is how it works I think for me the the other two sort of success points would be how many times at the end of our first year could the executive say, I'll actually, the Guardian Council identified blind spots for us? Because when you're, when you're running an organization, it's sometimes you have to make decisions so quickly, or, you know, there's so many, it's, sometimes you don't see the blind spots. So for example, you know, do you want to sell a westernized mindful app in India, which is based on yoga and meditation? Let's let's have a think about that for a moment, shall we? And the cultural appropriation of that, the the way that it's landing. Like so, for me, when you're running a business, like that could be a real blind spot when you're particularly when you're a global organization. Whereas we are the stewards of the agenda, and we can go, well, hang on a minute, are you have you talked to local people, and is this being led by local people, and what's the cultural nuances of that, and how is what's the integrity of that? Not for us to solve but go away and think about that properly and then come back to us because I don't want to be aligned to an organization that is developing a colonial approach to a, a systems change like that's not that's not so I guess our values then lends itself to that so for me that's how many times did we pick blind spots that were you know around intellectual property or culture or diversity that the, the executives can go you you did that 10 times last year and thank you that for me will be like great we've done a good job and the other thing is how many times did we then like nudge to investigate so to your point liam when do, when will the guardian council become sort of more involved in leaning in on and bringing things rather than reacting to what you're presenting and i i don't think i you know it's too early but there'll be stuff that I see that I'll want to go, actually, you, you need to speak to Together All and their platform or their clinical um, systems that they've set up or the global communities that they're bringing, like go and have a chat, not necessarily to do business or partnerships, but learn. So, so that will be the other bit is how many times have I helped nudge curiosity or investigation that the executive teams have 
had a think about it and thought it was a good idea to go and have a look at it. I mean, that's that's a great point. And I think that um, we will know that we are um, in the right terrain, I think, when there might be a little bit of tension because those that space between the exec, the board of directors and the Guardian Council, I think that's where the most interesting stuff can happen. But it's also the area where, well, what are the different roles here? What is the, the role of the Guardian Council vis-a-vis -a, -vis a director, vis-a-vis -vis one of the um, exec? You know, we talked about a lot about trust over the last hour or so. And I think that, you know, this is something that Eric has said to me about the about his Guardian Council, that if you are able to have sufficient level of independence for the Guardian Council and a, and a high level of trust between the Guardian Council and particularly the exec, you will be able to go on to those onto that terrain, which is a bit a bit trickier, which is where the real uh, uh, magic can happen, I think. Where, where do any of you see that scope for friction or the moment that makes you walk away? I can't think I've seen it. I mean, and I think that, I think colleagues have, have made the point earlier that it is about the response um, and the attitude that the executive have brought to Guardian Council, and I just wish I could see that. I mean, one of the, the reasons I, 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 I've always found working with social enterprise and social impact organizations much more stimulating than uh, working with traditional organizations. And I, I think of the openness, uh, now it could do, it could also happen though if we forgot what our role was, um, and as somebody who's both been an executive, non-executive director, uh, I think it's very important not to confuse what we can offer with the sort of things we may do in another existence or have done in another existence. Um, and I think an element of mutual respect there is, is it's built in. I felt it from the first conversation I had with Liam and then with Henry. I did wonder if I was only being invited to come in because I would, they needed somebody on the Guardian Council who would be older, older than Liam, but there was a broader... <laughs> oh, God, busted. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, I, I, and, and the fact that we, you know, it, it's a very, it's, it's a serious but informal relationship. We can have good conversations and it feels as if I don't feel I'm holding back um, maybe some people think I should hold back but I feel I can be honest and I can say what I'm thinking and I will get a response that gives me an, an, an honest response to that um, so I think we probably are experiencing it. I think there might be upper things come up but it will be a, a time to sit back and reflect and say sorry are we getting out of our getting into an, another role which mm -hmm. isn't actually ours and if we were trying to do that, we'd lose the value of being uh, the Guardian Council because it's, it is a very different responsibility. Yeah, I think. Go ahead, Satna. Sorry, Liam. I, I just wanted to say that I, I think Ian's right. We haven't felt that friction or I haven't felt it, but I could anticipate if others were doing this, that friction could arise. And I think some of the things could be around role clarity for sure. I also think that it's important for the shareholders to really see an added value. So it's what Poppy said. I think we kind of have to prove ourselves too around the added value of us being able to look at blind spots, bring different perspectives and different kind of diverse um, opinions. Also our networks, ambassadors and our expertise. Um, we Somebody brought to our council a partnership the other day and a few of us had worked with them and had special insight and I hope what will happen, which will break down any friction that could be there, is demonstrating our added value and the benefit and kind of what I would say a complementary role to the shareholders. Because I, I, if I was on a sh as a shareholder or a board member of an organization and a new council came to make decisions or inform decisions we're supposed to make, I could sense, I think there would be a natural friction. So I think it will take time but I think it's about building a trust and, and demonstrating the added value that we do bring and how um, we link together. 
Kevin, you're a uh, you are the most one of, were our biggest shareholder, still a big shareholder, and the investor that really kept the company going during some difficult years a few years ago. What 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 do you think the value of a, from a shareholder perspective? What value do you think something like the Guardian Council brings? And what are your anxieties, if any, about it? Um, I think, well, I think from a macro level, I worry that too many impact businesses mark their own homework and aren't held to account. And I think that holds back uh, impact investing as an aggregate because people can see in authenticity, they can see the charlatans, they can see people who are purely profit maximizing, but trying to put an impact, lick a paint on it. Um, so from that perspective, I, I think we feel as a board, as investors, we are deeply motivated by the impacts of the business for a whole host of reasons, um, be they, it, 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 provides incredible drive for the team. It's a great unifying thing. It's our superpower for bringing talent to the business. I think purpose drives particularly younger people. Uh, I think it, it can attract more and more capital. It, it gives you, it's just a powerful thing. But we need to be honest about it, be prepared to be opened up to scrutiny um, as a whole. So from my point of view, there was that awkward squad is a really welcome thing. Yes, we're going on that, that, that cusp where we're going to have friction. We're going to be at risk. If we do something wrong, we're going to get called out. But that should be fine because we should be able to conduct our business consistently with coming from the, the right place and with the right intention. It doesn't mean we won't make mistakes. But, but yeah, this, this group will not go, oh, you made a mistake. That's it, right? It's how we, how we came to the decisions, how we act in them, and how we resolve them if we go in, in directions and all directions. So I think it's that holding us to account, not marking our own homework. And as, as panel said, you, you can see around different corners to us. You bring different aspects, different geographies, different diversities, different sectors, wealth of experience. Um, we are not, as a board, mental health experts. Um, we're passionate about it, but we've got so much to learn. And why would we not avail ourselves the opportunity to learn from Experts. Yeah. Um, what, we've listed a few few things here. You know, trust, openness, mutual respect, role clarity. If somebody else was thinking about setting up a guardian council, what other sort of conditions do you think need to be there for them to be a success? Other than brilliant people in a slightly old chair. <laughs> There's age discrimination going on here. I'm sure that there must, we must have a rule against. I must put it to the Guardian Council. Um, I just uh, briefly, I would say, I think real clarity of focus. So sitting behind uh, all of this uh, is some paperwork, is some clarity of roles, is description of you know where authority begins and ends. Um, uh, 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 so I think it's not simply. You know the process is let's pick half a dozen brilliant people have them turn up so you know we, we pay a fee uh we i think it's a, a it's the same fee that you would get if you sat on an nhs trust so it's not a huge amount of money but it's enough to show respect uh, for people's time and also not open people up to the accusation well you're only doing this for the money because they're clearly not so i think that clarity about the terms and conditions and this led to, as you know, Kevin, a lot of discussion on the um, the board about exactly where that line would be drawn um, on the levels of authority and so on uh, of the Guardian Council. So my advice to anyone who's thinking of doing a Guardian Council is make sure your board are 110% bought, bought in and you do the work on uh, the frames of uh, the terms of reference. Anything to add from the panel? Um, I, I would say a good chair, <laughs> um, you know, whatever yeah. they may be. Um, uh, but I, I do think having an experienced chair that understands the difference between the executive and actually the boundaries and going through 
the development of the Guardian Council. So, as I said earlier, I, you know, I'm thinking about another Guardian Council of young people, but actually these young people wouldn't have had board experience or executive experience. So how do I set them up not to fail? And do I, and what the, does that chair role look like initially? And not to be afraid of getting it perfect straight away. So I think for me, there's a period of probably six to eight months of developmental where we're, we're developing as a team and the chair needs to understand that. And you may hand over the chair role to a different point, different person in time. But I think getting that, that, that it's, it's a developmental process to get to understanding what the Guardian Council's relationship with the executives and the organization is going to be. And that will be unique you won't be able to mimic that like that would be unique to the business and each time you create it so i think that is the other beauty of this we all know what boards do we all know what executive boards do what the process is what the board agenda looks like the meetings for that we've had so far sometimes there's been three four papers on various things sometimes there's been we need a decision on this can you just jump on a call for 30 minutes and I love that. I love the fact that it's not the same meeting each time. And I like the spontaneity of it as well. I'm could, I just could I just emphasize the importance of the chair, Kevin, just before we move on? Yeah, I, I heard it as we need a new chair, Lynn. I, 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 <laughs> I heard it very differently. Okay, yeah, as you always do. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyone else anything to add on that one? Just a small success factor that I also think was when we were hired in our first meeting, it, it didn't go, here's the terms of reference, here's how we're going to work, we'll come to you once a month, as Poppy was saying, and do this agenda, we'll ask you this, it was how do you see this working, here's some of the boundaries, obviously, this is how our shareholder works, here's how our business, but how do you want this to work, and I don't even think we've completely, um, it's not set in stone, we understand that it will evolve based on needs and uh, priorities. And I, I thought that was a really nice way to approach and at least get all of us to buy in and work together and build a relationship and trust among us from the beginning. I just say that uh, just uh, as, a, as a, a, a very real example of that, which came from Ian, I think it was at the, the last meeting where he asked, is there a way, so we meet as a collective, is there a way that we could hook up individual um, Guardian Council members with particular executives who might be sitting with partic particular conundrums or questions which an individual um, Guardian Council member could help them with. And that was, I had my arm bitten off by the exec when I, when I put that to them. Um, and the exec, I've got a three day um, away day next uh, week with lots of new people that have joined in uh, the United States as well as the UK. And they're coming back with, so brace yourself guys, they're coming back with a list of ways in which individual execs can connect with individual guardian council. I, I would never have thought of that or asked it because I, I would have thought maybe that's just going a bit too far with these people's time and I didn't want to sort of trespass too much. That was a great example of how trying to keep a, an open conversation led to what I think could be a really powerful way in which not only will execs benefit from uh, the wisdom of the Guardian Council, but the Guardian Council members individually will learn more about the business, which will then make us better as a group. One last question for me, I think, is um, staying in the organisation. Um, together what's been around in one form or another for quite some time. Liam, from your perspective, why now? And, and when is an organisation too small, too big, or, or, or not right for a Guardian Council? In your opinion? That's a really good question. I would say, why now? I think a big uh, FPE who came in as an investor last um, year, excellent uh, fund, have have two new um, have two two members on our um, uh, board. Uh, confusingly, another man called Henry and a, a man called Clue. And um, I thought, with great advice and support from Kevin, that this was a really important watershed in the in, in the company. The FPE had invested in us because they saw the the impact of the purpose, and they also saw a business opportunity 
uh, to, to grow a company and its valuation for them to seek a, a, a return. And that the, the chances are that we will have experienced dramatic growth over the next few years as we help more and more people um, in order to stay true to our purpose and straight, stay true to our mission, as well as learning as we grew, now was the time to do it because there'll be at a very sort of basic level, there's gonna be so much for the exec to do, so much for the board of directors to do, to guide the company as it grows, putting alongside that a guardian council at this time of the co company's growth just seemed the right time to do it actually. And, and so far it really has. You've worked in various organizations, others various sizes, Hughes, et cetera, et cetera. Would, where would this not land? Is that for me, Kevin? Oh, whatever. I'd say startup would be difficult. I think it might be if you had a startup um, and you brought in a, a, a heavyweight group like this, I think that, that would be difficult with the, I think there has to be a certain scale of an organization in order to be able to absorb the, 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 the weight and the authority of a group like this and, and, to be, and to be grown up enough in order to engage with a group like this and also um, have the ears to hear and then be able to act on it. Okay, um, I could keep going. I'm, there, we haven't any questions from the, from the audience. I don't know what that means. Um, okay, here you go. Um, somebody I know who would also fall under the awkward squad uh, label. Um, how would you how would you manage the tensions if the guardian council has a strongly held view on a matter and the board wants to progress with a different decision? I'll give you uh, perhaps you you take it. Um, from the GC perspective, I'll take it from the board's perspective. Do you want to take that? Um, we've got, I mean, it's, the easy answer to that is that it's spelled out in, in the terms of reference, is that ultimately the, um, the, uh, the, the board of directors has fiduciary and legal responsibility for the development of the company, so ultimately, if there is a, a, a sincerely held difference of opinion on a particular way in which the, the company should go, ultimately it would be the board that, that, that has to decide that and has the legal duty to decide it. What I would hope from a, a, you know, the chair of the Guardian Council as, well as a board member is that um, that could be an amicable, you can get, you can get there amicably. And if that, if that is done with transparency, there will be you know, justifiably held differences um, of opinion, as long as we give enough airtime to the conversation, the Guardian Council feel that they are adequately informed and not blindsided on something, I, I, think, I think it's manageable. I can't imagine that in every scenario where the Guardian Council and the Board of Directors are going to agree on everything. That would be impossible, I think. But I'd be interested to hear what the, the rest of the team think about that. I, I, look, I'll, I'll go first and then um, maybe colleagues chime in, but I think um, you're right. It, it would be rather boring, wouldn't it, if all of us had been on it the whole time. I mean, it would just be such a, like, what's the point on that? How, where's the stretch and where do we learn? I think for me, it, I'm completely clear that actually my, my role is to highlight the blind spots, nudge in the right direction, make sure the right questions have been asked and that I'm satisfied with those responses. I think for me, like I, I also think in every any, any job that you're in, executive, non-executive, guardian council, you need to know when your time's up to move on and you need to know what your boundaries are. And for me is if my integrity is compromised, then I, that, that's the point that I will have a very clear conversation with the right people to make sure that it's an elegant and appropriate exit for all because it's the organization or that you know is going in a direction that doesn't that no longer fits and i think that happens all the time we do it all the time in these kind of roles um so that's nothing new but i think to be able to do it to but 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 the point is to remain in the organization and have the conflict and the tension um is exactly right so i would i would say that i would want 
you know, what is accountability is me asking the questions, us asking the questions as a guardian council and being confident that the responses that we've got have been properly thought through. And then it's up to the executive team to actually get, get on and do, do, do the job because it's, it's, it's a business. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's where I would sit with that is actually I'm, I'm looking forward to some of the conflicts. It'd be fun. I'm going to see, I'm going to test the, test our chair at that point. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll chip in from the company side and thank you for the question, Susan. Um, it's the point that to come a lot is word trust. And we, we as impact investors and as people, I think have always understood that trust is something that's very slow to build, very quick to break. Yeah. And so we've, we've very, careful about that and um, when we chose investment partners, board members, guiding council, we've always been very careful about what else we bring to the mix because this is, this is critical to the, the business. We also happen to believe that high level of trust is, is consistent with a very successful business financially as well. I think um, where the risk comes is both you know, my fund and FP will at some point sell this business to new owners. If, if, which could be the management, it could be anything else. That choice of when you hand over, as I don't know, at least one, one attendee of this session knows, when you hand over from one partner you know to one you don't, and you think they understand that trust is a critical success factor, you think their orientation is right, but you just don't know, that's when it's going to get punchy. And when it comes to that point, you know, this, this group will be discussing, we've had an offer and we've had several, you know, to the company or to invest. We have that discussion that will be punching because this will be a successful business covering millions of people incredibly sticky business incredibly successful business there will be frankly eye-watering amounts of money offered to this business at some point so that's when it's going to get really uh difficult day to day i think what i would wish we had is clarity greater clarity around our fiduciary duty as directors such that we can truly Think about all communities, profit sufficiency in some of these things, whilst fully acting within all the all the company's law and everything else. Because it's frankly, it's not as clear as it should be that we are in, no. the, in the greater interest. That would be my magic wand moment. Um, and then we'd all operate, I think, in a better environment to be able to help the world consistently and without some of the turmoil that comes with so doing. Yeah, and and I think that 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 moment might not be far off when you consider what's going on in the digital healthcare market and the mergers that have gone on uh, you know in the last in the last few weeks and the amount of money that is coming into the uh, into the market i think that um yeah i think it's i i i would guess that's not so far off yeah i, I think i've just seen the digital version of a shepherd's hook grabbing me <laughs> in the off stage um <laughs> Does that mean Tom's going to come in to Dubai? Did I get that right? It, it does. <laughs> um, thank you, guys. That, that was brilliant and, and, and fascinating. And I hope that everyone listening at least consider whether a guiding house was, is right for their organisation from what they've heard today. Um, thank you to all our panellists and everyone for tuning in around the world. Uh, thank you to Together All for your partnership on the discussion today and to our brilliant event partner InnoVision helping to bring this to life.